Welcome to the webinar, everybody. We will start shortly. Make yourselves comfortable. Okay, so I think we can get going. Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome everybody to the second edition of our Scrap and Iron Ore Markets uh, Focus. Um, I am Adam Smith, I'm the Kalanish Global Editor, and I am joined today by my colleagues Tom Gutierrez, who's our Asia Editor, and Burçak Alpan, who's our Turkey Steel Journalist. Um, so the format of the, the format of the webinar will be the presentations by each of my colleagues, uh, Burchak followed by uh, Tom, and then at the end of the webinar we will have a question and answer session uh, where you will be um, able to uh, ask questions and uh, we, will, we will try and address them later at the end. Uh, there is a question uh, chat function in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen that can be used at any time during the webinar. If you think of a question while my colleagues are presenting, then uh, please add uh, it into that box and we will address it at the end. There will also be polls carried out during the presentations with multiple choice voting. Uh, and I would encourage you to take part in these polls. Uh, please vote, we'd like to hear your view. It's completely anonymous, the voting, so it will not be attributed to, to anybody. But we would like to make the webinar as interactive as possible. So please do take part in the voting. Um, the, the presentation is actually, both presentations are actually available also in the handout section, uh, also in the control panel on your right-hand side. So you can, feel free to download them at any time during the webinar. We will also be providing a link in 24 hours time uh, um, by email that will allow you to download the presentation as well as the video recording of the webinar. Um, yeah, so uh, without any further ado, uh, I would like to uh, pass the, uh, the microphone to my colleague uh, Borcha Galpman, who will be giving us an in-depth view into the scrap market. Borcha, please. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll be covering Turkey scrap market today with some short-term outlook. Hope you enjoy it. Your feedbacks and questions are highly welcomed. Sorry for this. Okay, um, starting with some brief information. In 2019, Turkey ranked as the eighth biggest crude steel producer in the world with 33.7 million metric tons of production. Production contracted in all regions last year with the exception of Middle East and the Asia. Worldwide global electric arc furnace production was unchanged at 523 million tons in 2019. During January-May period this year, Turkey keeps its position as the eighth largest crude steel producer in the world with 13.4 million tons of production, down 5.6% compared to the same period of 2019. Total steel production capacity in Turkey is approximately 52 million tons. Steel scrap consumption soared 15% in China last year to 215 million tons, 
and underlines China's position as the world's largest steel scrap consumer. 27.9% of the world's steel production comes out of electric arc furnaces, while 717 .7 comes from blast furnaces. Next slide, please. Can we move to the next slide? Okay, coming to Turkey, as seen in the outputs based on different production processes, unlike the world, 67.8% of Turkish quick steel output is produced by electric arc furnaces, which makes Turkey, Turkey steel production highly dependent on scrap. In 2020, five-month electric arc furnace production appeared at 9 million tons, while blast furnace production was at 4.4 million tons, down 5.3 and 6.2 respectively on year. This has caused electric arc furnace steel production share to decrease to 67% in overall Turkey steel production. Scrap consumption by electric arc furnaces in Turkey last year stood at 93%, while scrap consumption by Turkish blast furnaces stood only at 7%. Turkey imported 18.8 million tons of steel scrap last year. Over January May this year, Turkey's scrap imports increased 5.8% on year to 8 million tons, despite the 5.6% decrease seen in crude steel production. The US was again the largest supplier with 1.6 million tons. Domestic scrap share among Turkey's scrap consumption in 2019 was only 32.6% with 9.1% million tons. This makes Turkey as the world's foremost steel scrap importer. This chart here shows a trend of Turkish imported scrap in 2020. It shows daily price changes and represents Baltic and US origin HMS 80 to 20. Now we will examine which factors have been effective on imported scrap prices recently. But before we have a poll where we want to see what you think about current scrap prices, uh, which are at 258.5 dollars CFR Turkey right now. Uh, okay, everybody. So as you can see, there's a uh, poll open for you, the, our first poll for you to, to vote in. Um, and the question is, how do you see the current HMS 8020 scrap price level in Turkey? $257 per ton CFR. Is it A, healthy, B, low, or C, high? We'll close the voting after 15 seconds. Okay, thank you, everybody. I see that 45% of our attendees find the price levels healthy, only 24% finds low, and 21% finds the levels high. Okay, let's see what happened in Turkey's scrap market since April. After the link their steel scrap purchases in March due to the negative effects of the virus on the global steel demand. Turkish mill scrap purchases are recommenced in April. 
However, due to the outbreak and lockdowns, the scrap supply in the world fell significantly and Turkish mills faced sharp price increases. However, seeing no sufficient support from rebar demand and prices and having squeezed scrap rebar margin, Turkish mills exerted pressure on scrap prices while halting their purchases again, but scrap could only fall to 240 levels due to the tight supply. Although scrap flow have increased following the ease of coronavirus measures after May, supply was yet to be sufficient and flow have increased following the ease of coronavirus measures after uh, in the back of Turkey's and other importer countries high scrap demand. China's strong demand for semi-finished steel and finished steel helped boosting the market. However, after China slowed its imported steel demand and Turkey has fulfilled its July shipment scrap purchases and given a break to focus on finished steel sales before buying August shipment scrap cargoes, scrap prices have softened. Uh, although Turkish mills have exerted high pressure on prices, they have failed to decrease prices at desired levels below 245 levels and prices followed more or less stabilized trend in the first week of July. Last week, however, the sharp increase seen in iron ore prices, which have reached their one-year highest levels, returned confidence in Chinese market, and Turkey's obvious need for August shipment scrap purchases caused scrap suppliers to increase their offers to $260 CFR. Although U.S. domestic scrap prices recorded a sharp decrease in July trading last week, in Asia, scrap has started rising again after, after July come to auction results amid tight supply. U.S. origin scrap price, which decreased to 253 levels last week, has increased to 258.5 CFR in the most recent deals concluded this week. However, most offers from the U.S. and Baltic stand at above 260 today. U.S. suppliers are seen to have directed their cargoes to Turkey rather than their domestic market where prices are weak. On the other hand, increasing euro-dollar parity and higher duck prices make it difficult for European suppliers to, to conclude sales to Turkey. Can we move one more, please? So how was rebars performing during that time? Rebar demand contracted in all regions due to the pandemic. Turkish mills, however, were forced to reflect scrap price increases in rebar prices as their mar margins did not allow otherwise. However, they couldn't achieve to sell at offer prices due to the lack of demand and their customers' price pressure. As a result, rebar prices could only increase $30, while scrap increased more than 50 in April. Towards the end of May, however, Turkish steelmakers have seen significant increase in their domestic market after Turkish government announced new in incentives for housing sales. Meanwhile, China's demand for semi-finished and finished steel increased significantly. Turkey sold almost 70,000 tons of rebars to the U.S. and a few large tonnage rebar cargoes to Hong Kong in May. Turkey has been the largest supplier of rebars in the U.S. in May. Uh, after mid-June, however, with the softening seen in scrap prices, buyers' expectations for rebar price drops caused them to halt their purchases and rebar's demand slowed. Uh, last week, however, once confidence has returned to the Chinese domestic market, Turkey has achieved to sell more large tonnage car rebar cargoes to Hong Kong. This week, following the recovery seen in scrap prices, Turkey has increased export prices with the support of domestic market. Current offers of rebars stand at $415-$425 FOB in Turkey.
Next slide, please. This graph here shows the trend of HMS 8020 CFR Turkey scrap and Turkish rebar FOB prices since 2015. As you may see, the margin sometimes tightens and sometimes widens, but most of the time, prices follow similar trends. Next slide, please. Between 2015 and January 2020, average margin between scrap and rebar appeared at $174.2 with high fluctuations, as you can see on this graph. Next slide, please. The red line here shows the average margin, while the blue line refers to the average cost. We consider $160 as average rebar production cost from scrap with a very rough calculation. It is based on scrap prices at approximately $200. Uh, the higher the scrap price means the higher wastage, which increases the, increases the cost, of course. On the other hand, there are many factors affecting this cost, such as capacity utilization, energy, total capacity of the mill. Um, lower capacity utilization means average cost about $160. Although it hit $142, which is the lowest since March 2017, in January and in May this year, it has then recovered and currently with the sharp increase seen in Turkey's rebar offer prices this week, it stands at $161.5, slightly above average cost. The scrap rebar margin has gone above average cost for the second time this year uh, since April. Next slide, please. So how is the situation with billets? Assuming billet is at 385 CFR Turkey and scrap is at 258.5 CFR Turkey, producing rebars from billets is more advantageous versus producing from scrap today. When the margin between billet and scrap prices widens, scrap gets the advantage, but most of the time, producing billets is more advantageous, as you can see on this chart. Next slide, please. Another graph demonstrating the cost of rebars produced from billet versus scrap. Today, when billet price is 385 CFR Turkey and scrap is at $258.5 CFR Turkey, there is a difference of $8.8 .8 between producing from scrap and billet, with billet having the advantage. So before sharing our outlook with you, we would like to see where you see the prices in the coming period. Here comes the second poll question. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, here now you have an opportunity to vote in the second poll, please. Uh, get involved. The question is, where do you see the CFR Turkish scrap price level in August? Is it below $240 per ton, between $240 and $260 per ton, between $260 and $280 per ton, between $280 and $300, or finally above $300? 30 seconds longer to vote. Please remember it's completely anonymous and we would love to hear your views. You have a very good photo proportion so far. They're coming in thick and fast. 15 more seconds. Please vote if you haven't done so already. Where do you see Turkish scrap in August? How optimistic or pessimistic are you? Realistic would be the third option, obviously. And we're done. Okay, so 43% of our attendees think prices will be between 240 and 260 levels. 40% think 260 to 280. 
and 9% think 280 to 300, and 8% think below 240. Only 1% of our attendees think it will be about 300. Okay, thanks for your votes. Next slide, please. Before getting into details with our outlook, we wanted to share some news that may affect Turkish scrap markets directly or indirectly in the future. New European safeguard rules become effective, though no one satisfied with the changes. Turkey appears to be the country that will see its exports to Europe the most hit by the new safeguard review. As a consequence, the trade tensions with Europe are mounting. Back in May, Turkey made an appeal to the EU to stop the further limitation of quotas for Turkish products, threatening to implement additional customs duties of between 9 to 17% on imports from the EU. European rebar quota for Turkey is fulfilled in the first 10 days of the new quota term, which started in July 1. The Latin American Steel Association, ISERO, has stated that the increase in Chinese export tax rebate poses a threat to the steel industry in Latin America. Low activity arising from the virus has led to oversupply in Latin America, where steel inventories are 20 million tons higher compared to the previous year. Following the duties imposed on some steel product imports from 20 May, Turkey has implemented new import duties up to 20% on some flat steel and pipe products from 28 June. Also yesterday, Turkey has extended duties on imported steel products, which were increased by five points in April until September 30. Although the situation is still developing in Egypt, Turkey is expected to benefit from 10% duty exemption for producers in Egypt. Even traders that can prove they are importing under a contract to sell to a manufacturer can also apply for exemption. The exemption is for producers that use flat steel. The United Steelworkers Union in Canada has warned that certain steel products from the nation could again be hit by Section 232 tariffs by President Donald Trump's administration, despite the USMCA agreement. Canada shipped 2 million tons of steel to the US in the first five months of 2020, up by 9.7%. And Mexico's steel shipments to the US rose by 12.1% to more than 1.44 million tons. Some domestic sources don't like the trend, of course, especially given that the increases coincided with a sharp drop in US steel output due to the virus. China will ban the imports of solid waste as of 2021 for environmental protection, protection reasons. Um, the, new, the new waste import policy does not cover ferrous scrap. It remains uncertain, however, whether this means only the ban on ferrous scrap imports will be lifted or if the licensing restrictions will also be lifted. In either case, imports are expected to significantly higher in 2021. Next slide, please. Our outlook for semi-finished and finished steel markets. Manufacturing and construction activities that had previously been completely halted in many places um, due to the lockdowns and gradually boosting demand, though still demand is still expected to contract in 2020. We are expecting to see more protectionist measures, specifically in the countries where imports are a threat for domestic production and employment. With demand remaining limited, we are expecting buyers' pressure on steel prices to continue. Turkish domestic demand is expected to remain strong with governmental incentives. 
Turkey is still one of the countries together with, with Vietnam and China where consumption is expected to record an increase in 2020. However, local demand alone is not sufficient and must be supported with export demand in order Turkish steel industry to recover. Libya and Syria are the new targets of Turkish mills for rebar sales. Um, instead of being a threat, China took advantage of low prices of semi-finished steel and HRC and co concluded purchases from the global market. CISA said that Chinese demand in the second half will exceed first half. So strong, strong Chinese demand is expected to keep cheap Chinese steel from depressing export destinations. Now that confidence has arrived to the Chinese domestic market, probably there will be some space for imports, especially for semi-finished steel. However, it is questionable if Turkey can compete with Russia, Vietnam, Indonesia and India, uh, which have slightly competitive prices in the global billets markets. The highest risk among all is, of course, the virus, which is still with us. Next slide, please. And our outlook for scrap. Step by step, scrap, scrap activities are returning. Um, with the restarting of automotive industry, supply noticeably improved after May. Oversupply of scrap has resulted with a significant price drop, specifically in the prime grades in July trading last week in the US where steel industry is yet to exceed 58% utilization rate. Uh, so we're expecting a surplus in global scrap supply as demand is expected to remain limited due to the lower capacity utilization rates arising from the foreseen contraction in steel consumption. Turkey's scrap demand, however, is expected to accelerate as Turkey has bought only a few cargoes for August shipments. In order to secure deliveries on time, Turkish mills are expected to increase scrap demand in the short term. Approaching holiday and maintenance seasons uh, in the EU are expected to lower both scrap supply and demand. Um, although transportation within Germany is still functioning, there is uh, an expectation of lower water levels for several rivers as seen in the previous years. Scrap transportation via inland waterways might suffer and higher freight rates may be seen as a result. Freight rates are likely to increase for short sea scrap as shipments increase with the starting of grain season. Scrap prices in both northern and southern Europe are expected to soften on month for July settlements amid continued soft finished steel demand. Mills are seen to be pushing for discounts amid low finished steel demand. The European market is hit the most by the virus and yet to return to pre-pandemic levels. On the other hand, just like, just unlike the producers, exporters in the Benelux have slightly increased their duck prices this week following the increases seen in Asia and Turkey's expected return. Next slide, please. Scrap prices in Turkey have decreased after mid-June, just like we have forecasted in our June webinar. However, considering today's market conditions, we are expecting stronger scrap prices up to the end of July now. Though we predict volatility to remain, to remain very diminished as in June. But of course, there are facts that uh, impact the prices and are unpredictable, such as political developments, trade wars, new anti-dumping cases, sudden changes in foreign exchange rates as we now experience in Euro-Dollar parity, and of course the virus. This was the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. Now I'll hand over to Adam. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Burçak, for that very insightful and detailed look into the uh, Turkish scrap and rebar markets, and also um, a very interesting look at other events globally which are impacting uh, the steel market. It's good to hear that. Um, I, I think we all think the same, that global capacity utilization is in general expected to remain low uh, for now, but it's good to hear that um, Turkish scrap bookings are likely to accelerate in the short term and support uh, scrap prices at least for the rest of July. And also that uh, Chinese demand is rebounded and uh, that uh, China is returning to the import market and that it doesn't threaten um, in, in the short term um, the export market as it did a few years ago. Uh, China Chinese demand is something which um, is going to be talked about more now um, by my colleague uh, Tom uh, Gutierrez. Uh, before I hand over to him, I would like to remind everybody that um, questions, any questions you have, we have a lot of questions coming in already. Um, any other questions um, you have, please put them in the box on the right hand side in the control panel and we will answer them at the Q&A uh, session at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Tom Gutierrez, who will talk a little bit about uh, iron ore, the iron ore market and what's happening in China. Take it away, Tom. Thanks, Adam. And uh, thank you all uh, for joining us again. Um, if uh, we can move on to my, my next slide, please. Now, I can see from the numbers that uh, some of you may have joined us last week, but uh, many of you certainly didn't. So uh, let me just review one slide that I showed you last week, which was uh, our expectations of iron ore prices with three basic scenarios. Uh, one was based on the previous uh, expectations that the summer would see a slowdown in end user demand and that that would bring down iron ore prices in the short term. That wasn't our base case. Our base case was that prices would remain fairly high for around a quarter, um, but would end the year slightly lower. And then there was a third case, which was that prices would remain, broadly speaking, where they are around $100 um, and have a strong second quarter on the assumption that perhaps there were more issues with supply uh, and perhaps also that Chinese demand uh, again surprised to the upside. Since we spoke to you last, obviously iron ore prices have uh, have moved fairly dramatically again. So after starting to decline in the period when uh, there was a general consensus in China that the end user demand would decline, prices then shot up pretty suddenly um, in the last week or so. And prices uh, today are fairly settled, um, but still you know holding over $110 a ton which is obviously firmer than expected. Uh, if you go to my next slide, then uh, you can see how uh, our uh, attendees voted in the poll last week. Which of these scenarios did they think was the most likely? So 39% agreed with us, 37% uh, expected a weaker market, and 24% were quite optimistic about iron ore prices for the rest of the year. So I think we're gonna have the poll here um, Adam, if you can bring that up. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please take part in the following poll. The question is, how long will iron ore prices stay at around current levels, which is between $100 and $115 per ton? Uh, will it be A for one month, B for three months, and C all year? We'll give you a minute in total to vote. So we are at half time now. Please do take part. It's anonymous and we'd love to hear your opinion. How long will iron ore prices stay at around current levels? One month, three year, three months, all year. We'll close the poll in 10 seconds. We have a very high Voter percentage here. So we'll hand it back to Tom. Thanks, Adam. So again, it's a very close split. Um, this time we have a very slight lead, 41% uh, saying it will remain high for three months, 
40% for one month and uh, a slightly lower 19% saying it's going to be high all year. Um, the, the interesting factor of this in terms of what has changed, uh, which we will look at in a moment, is uh, are people making the decision based on a change in the supply side or the demand side? And uh, if we can go on to the back to the slides now, uh, we'll start by looking at the, the supply side. So there has been a slight change in expectations over the last month. Um, but uh, we would like to point out that we, we don't think it's a change in expectations really for the whole of the second half. So our expectations are still that overall Brazilian supply is most likely to pick up, be higher in the second half than, than the first half. Um, and Australian supply is still expected to remain fairly high. Uh, after all, miners are, are really making a pretty good amount of money at these prices. But there has been a change over the last month, and part of that has been that Australian miners slightly reduced their shipments after the end of uh, the first half, at the end of their reporting period. And then Brazilian exports have also continued to fluctuate, and this is, remains one of the, the big unknowns of the market. Um, the impact of the coronavirus in Brazil has been um, somewhat difficult to predict, partly because the, the Brazilian government's response has been uh, not particularly proactive at the central level, uh, but local states have been more proactive. And uh, deals between miners and local governments have changed expectations of volumes in the second half uh, from time to time, and that, that remains a risk going forward. So at the moment, there's been a slightly slight reduction in the expectations for supply, but we expect that to balance out uh, quite shortly. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. The other side, of course, has been on the demand side, and, and really that's been about China. And China has really had a sudden surge in sentiment over the last week and a half or two weeks. So you can see here from uh, rebar futures contracts, uh, the rebar futures did dip uh, in late June and uh, just into early July. And that was based on that previous expectation that real steel demand would decline over the summer. In fact, real steel demand has declined over the summer. Um, that expectation has not really changed. But what has changed is the sentiment of traders. So because traders are now confident enough to hold inventory uh, between now and the autumn when real demand is expected to come back, that has in effect uh, eliminated that downward pressure on prices. And that sentiment has really been changed uh, through a concerted effort from the government. So you can see it obviously also in stock markets, which are now going back to or approaching the highs of the 2015 bubble uh, for the first time since then. So uh, if we go to my next slide, that in itself raises a question. Uh, if prices increase too quickly, uh, and if the government feels that the market has become excessively bullish, the government is uh, frequently concerned by risk and can move into stop speculative trading. Um, I give this as an example of uh, common conversations on, on WeChat in traders groups these days. Uh, this is a sign um, basically saying, uh, as you can see, the contradiction between the socialist and the capitalist market is the contradiction between people's desire to get rich quick and the regulators desire for everybody to slow down and move at an orderly pace. And uh, in the picture, you have the Buddhist monk, uh, Shanzong, speaking to the monkey king, Wu Gong. Uh, uh, can you please try to be a bit more civilized? Uh, how come you're always so impatient? And if those of you who remember 2015, uh, markets surged very rapidly, uh, but when China clamped down on margin trading and uh, began investigating specific traders, markets also collapsed very quickly. So some traders have raised the possibility of this. 
Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'd like to point out why I don't think that's currently the case. So the first thing is in the, the derivative markets themselves. If you look at the, the Shafi futures for, for rebar, the uh, trading volumes are not very uh, exaggerated. They're running at around a million uh, contracts a day. Uh, those of you who remember 2015, trading volumes are around 12 times that and considerably higher than at other times. Trading volumes at the moment are not higher than at the end of last year, for example. So that seems to uh, not be a bubble. It seems to be, there seems to be some genuine support there. It's not, it's not just because of financial investors moving in and out of the market. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the improvement in sentiment means that traders are holding on to inventory. And that is a, a very real sense of demand. If you speak to uh, domestic traders in, in the rebar spot market, they are selling steel at a higher rate than before um, because they can sell to other traders who are, are restocking. And you still have this continued uh, overlying factor which impacts iron ore, and that is the uh, scrap import ban. So when Chinese steel production declines currently, that decline is seen mainly in EAFs, and so hot metal production is impacted to a much lesser extent, and that keeps demand for iron ore high. Uh, if we go back, uh, sorry, to the next slide, then you can see the impact on inventories. And if you had seen this a month ago, you would have said prices should be falling at this point because in rising inventories with weak sentiment would have been pushing down rebar prices and uh, as a consequence, probably iron ore prices as well because margins are, are narrowing. But in fact, sentiment has been strong enough that even though inventories have increased, prices have not increased and have not decreased. Prices have actually remained very strong. Uh, and if we go to the next slide. I don't want to make it all about China. So um, <clears throat> I've added something here on global uh, blast furnace activity. So this is uh, our database of blast furnaces which have shut down outside of China. Uh, you can see very clearly the impact of coronavirus. Uh, the furnaces in our database peak at around 250,000 tons a day of production uh, offline. And that peak was in Q2. So uh, very different from China, where the, the, the peak in closures was early on in Q1. The rest of the world really saw a peak in April. And since then, blast furnace activity has actually remained quite steady. So blast furnace activity is low by historical standards, obviously, but there's also no real decline. So there's actually a, a, a fairly steady demand at current levels outside of of China when taking as a whole. There are some economies which will still see some declines and some economies which are already recovering. And that is another quite positive factor for iron ore globally. And if we go back to the next slide, one of the reasons for that stability and uh, for some of the, the regions seeing an increase again in, in blast furnace activity is china's ability to import steel so in particular for example in cis you're seeing blast furnace steel makers with very low export allocations because they've already sold very large volumes of steel into china and we're now approaching a point where you can legitimately ask if China will be a net importer for some months this year. If you look at uh, the data for May, which is the last month for which there is full data, net exports were the lowest since 2012. But if you look at June, uh, where we now have the finished steel data, we don't have the semi-finished steel data yet, then you already have net imports at the lowest since 2009. Uh, 2009 is the last period when China was a net importer, just for three or four months. And we're now in a position, because of the, the rise in iron ore prices, that China has become more confident in importing. 
during the period when there was an expected slowdown in demand in the summer and rising inventories, China slowed down its imports, but that has now reversed. And in the last week or so, China has been fairly aggressively importing uh, billet and HRC. So we could see another uh, period of net imports in the coming months if those exports continue to fall and the imports continue to rise. Uh, next slide, please. So then we come back really to the poll question, when will the market actually change? So far, the expectations of better Brazilian volumes have been partly outweighed by lower Australian shipments, and that has helped keep iron ore high. But as I said before, by the end of the year, that's expected to change. In terms of Chinese sentiment, it looks strong. If there is a crackdown on speculative activity in stock markets or something else that impacts sentiment significantly in the, the next few weeks, then you could see a, a sharp decline and the market could change. But in the absence of that kind of crackdown, the, the real question will be what happens to real demand in autumn? And as long as that is in line with expectations, then the, the Chinese demand for iron ore could remain strong for some time. And then the last corollary of that is how long can China continue importing high levels of steel? For the moment, it has not had a significant impact on prices. Uh, and so it seems to be sustained if imports, uh, if the domestic demand continues uh, strong in the autumn, then that could also continue for some time. And really that's unlikely to change until Q4 at the earliest. Uh, and that is why our base case is, is more or less unchanged, uh, but with a bit of a spike. Uh, so we, we actually agree with the, the highest poll number, the 41% who said that iron ore prices should remain strong for around three months. I'm going to leave it there, um, but I'm happy to take your questions uh, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Thank you very much, Tom, for that very insightful presentation. There's a lot of information there, uh, a lot of food for thought for everybody to process. Uh, we've had a lot of questions already. If you have any uh, still outstanding, then please feel free to ask them. We're going to address them now in the Q&A session. Uh, well, you heard it there, folks. Uh, China could potentially become an importer for the first time since 2009. So it's in a decade, uh, effectively event. Um, um, we, do, we do hope that uh, Chinese domestic demand does continue to be strong um, in, in autumn to support the rest of the global steel market. So let's come to your questions that we will put to our uh, two colleagues here. Um, I think we will start with uh, with Burchak. Um, Burchak, following your your very detailed uh, talk there about um, scrap and rebar in in Turkey, um, I'm just wondering if you think Turkey will be able to sell rebar at uh, at the level of four hundred twenty five dollars. Uh, per ton. Uh, why has there been such a big increase? Um, thank you, Adam. I don't think Turkey can sell its $425 this week at least because it's been a very sharp increase. It was actually most likely uh, most like a reflection of domestic market. Uh, domestic market is performing quite good in Turkey and you know higher domestic prices always uh, carry a risk for new uh, dumping investigations so it has been a really sharp increase but i don't think turkey can sell at these levels at least this week um i see and uh, of course it's it's a positive development that uh, Turkish domestic market, uh, Turkish domestic demand has uh, has improved because it saw a period, a prolonged period of very very weak demand, 2018 yeah. and 2019, yes. and, and uh, Turkish exporters can no longer count on on their domestic market to to support export prices, uh, so that's now changing uh, clearly, um, which is good. Um, so staying staying with you, um, Burçak. Uh, I'm just I'm hearing there may, there may be a potential of uh, the EU introducing some sort of restrictions or measures on on scrap exports. Uh, how likely do you think this is? 
Uh, well, actually, there are rumors of uh, measures ag against scrap exports. Um, and, you know, Eurofair has a very strong lobbying power in the EU. And, you know, Eurofair is not satisfied with the new uh, changes. And so they still think uh, imports should be uh, restricted. And there are talks about it, but I don't think it is likely in the short term. I see. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. And coming to Tom now. Um, Tom, you mentioned the uh, the bubble uh, that occurred in China in, in 2015. Um, what can China do to prevent that from reoccurring now, uh, this bubble in the futures market? Yeah, in 2015, the reaction was too slow and then too fast. So the government allowed the bubble to build up because everybody seemed to be winning out as the stock markets were rising. And then once they realized the level of risk that had built up, they cracked down very suddenly. And that created a lot of resentment because the last people buying up stocks were not the uh, well-informed and sophisticated traders, but the uh, the poor old grannies basically who had their savings uh, fiddled. Uh, by some dodgy investors and so that created a, a serious problem for the government and so now that that is fairly strongly imprinted in their mind it seems like they're moving to uh, control risk before uh, the, the chance of a, a serious collapse so we did see moves against margin trading uh, last week which uh, helped to limit the the amount of debt that unexperienced investors can get into going into into stock markets and into derivatives and it seems likely that there will be more measures like that um, the, the question will be whether it triggers a, a collapse or not and so far there's no sign of that so uh, this is why I, I disagree with the idea that the the market is so overheated that it could lead to a sudden collapse uh, it may come off but it, it, it shouldn't lead to a similar scenario as 2015. no sign of a collapse that's what we like to hear that's good um, and you mentioned obviously uh, chinese steel imports um, uh, and the increase thereof as being a major factor in the last few months um, driving the the global steel market and and, and prices globally um, it's it's interesting, and I mean, how do you see these imports uh, develop developing going forward? Do you think China will uh, will remain a, a you know a, a serious importer for the rest of the year? It seems likely for at least several months. Um, the the issue really is that key markets nearby have quite weak steel demand, and scrap prices are, are quite competitive at the moment. So. Uh, if you look at Taiwan this week, uh, we know that you know, US offers have been increasing, but actual deal prices haven't been increasing, um, really because the Taiwanese domestic rebar market has been uh, not particularly strong. And the same is true of countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia. And Vietnam is now a very important importer, uh, sorry, a very important exporter to China. Uh, it sold over 600,000 tons of, of billet to China so far this year, in the first five months of this year. So uh, there will certainly be continued imports, especially of semi-finished products from nearby suppliers. The question will be whether the more distant suppliers and whether finished steel imports will be sustained. And I suspect it will be sporadic, but there will be further opportunities in the future. Uh, we've, we've had a, a related question from uh, from one of our participants, um, and uh, it is how how long do you foresee exports of semi finished steel from India uh, to China uh, continuing? Um, if I could just add my 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 view on that, it seems most observers are saying. Uh, I mean, there has been there was obviously a, a huge increase in uh, steel in, uh, exports from India to China, driven mainly by semi finished steel in April and May. And this was when India um, was in lockdown uh, due to COVID-19 related measures. Um, and a lot of Indian steel producers most actually reduced capacity utilization significantly. 
Um, those that didn't, like Jindal Steel, JSPL, for example, um, they focused on supplying the export market because there was no domestic demand. Um, and a lot of those exports uh, did go to China because Chinese demand was there, China is buying. Uh, the jury is still out, of course, but most observers seem to think that uh, Indian demand will return now that the country is gradually reopening. It's going to be slow, but it will return, especially in the December quarter after the monsoons. Um, so that's going to absorb more production and take it away from the export market. Also, we've had in the last week um, or two a strengthening of the uh, Indian rupee against the, the dollar, which is obviously going to make Indian exports less competitive than they were previously. So uh, the idea is that those that trend of increasing exports to China is not sustainable. It won't continue in the long run. It was just a stopgap to fill um, the lack of domestic demand at home during during COVID. I don't know if you'd like to add anything, Tom, or is that pretty much covered? Yeah, I think the only thing to, to add is that there's there's kind of two key markets for uh, East and Southeast Asia from India, and that's the, the billet and the HRC. And at the moment, you know, the, the billet to China has been very strong, but obviously that's really premised on um, weak Indian demand, as you say, and especially you know, construction demand and so on. The HRC, in, I think HRC exports for India are more sustainable, but traditionally those would go more to uh, to Vietnam or elsewhere in Southeast Asia, and that's a, HRC is going to be harder to sell in China anyway. It will be sporadically competitive, but probably not in the same way that billet from Vietnam is, for example, um, partly because of the distance and partly just because um, billet prices in China allow for imports, whereas HRC prices uh, move in and out of um, competitiveness more frequently. So there's there's two different markets, but generally, yes, totally, I agree. Thank you, Tom. Um, coming back to to Burchak and and to scrap, uh, you mentioned in your presentation, Burchak, that. Uh, Turkish mills are expected to come back to the market now for um, the remainder of July and accelerate their bookings, um, which should support prices, hopefully. Um, what is your, it's obviously very difficult to forecast uh, any further than that because the situation is changing so rapidly and uh, uh, the, the world is still coming to terms with the COVID-19 pandemic. But what in your view, um, it, in terms of scrap, Im scrap imports into the Turkish market, will they, uh, continue, um, will, will, will mills be very active in buying for the rest of the year? Will uh, scrap imports continue to increase? Will prices continue to be supported for the rest of the year? Um, thanks, Adam. I think capacity utilization rates will reach to last year's levels uh, this year. It was 72% last year. Uh, so Last year we have imported 18.8 million tons of scrap, so this means we may uh, import similar uh, volumes this year. Uh, of course, scrap imports will increase because Turkey is dependent on imported scrap. But you know, uh, of course, uh, like we have seen in the previous month, they will give breaks, they will start again, they will start. They will try to sell finished steel. They will try to see support from global markets because, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, domestic demand is not uh, enough for Turkish steel industry to recover. So Turkish scrap imports will uh, likely to increase, uh, but there will be breaks, you know, and, but at the end, I think they're going to import like 18 million tons by the end of the year, at least. Thank you, Burchak. Um, perhaps um, a final question to Tom. How come iron ore is so robust, the price is so robust above $110 now, when the steel industry in, in other regions other than China is in, is in uh, disarray? Um, and also, what is your view on the uh, political impact on iron ore from, for example, China, China not buying from Australia. Yeah, so iron ore is supported because Chinese mills are, are buying, basically. I mean, the, the seaborne iron ore market is set by China. Um, you know, it's, a, it's not just that, it, that China is a larger 
uh, steel industry than other sectors. It's also that it's a larger proportion of the seaborne market. So you know, China is very dependent on imports. Um, so that seaborne price is really set by China. And Chinese blast furnaces have been able to keep operating at very high rates for most of the year, really because uh, China's domestic scrap market is not sufficiently developed for EAFs to uh, pick up the slack competitively. And so blast furnaces are running at high rates and China needs iron ore. So that's that's remained a constant uh, and is unlikely to change until China allows scrap imports, possibly next year. Um, in terms of the relationship with Australia, obviously the, the relationship is fraught. Um, but the trade that they're codependent really um australian iron ore exports without china would uh would collapse and chinese steel industry without imports from australia would collapse and so uh the chances of either of them moving to decisively to shut down that trade or you know to do anything really dramatic is is really minimal and it's also worth bearing in mind that the relationship between the two has always been fraught and that the relationship around commodities has always been fraught. Um, you know, those of us who remember what happened with uh, Rio Tinto and Chinalco will remember that that relationship has been very difficult before. And it was difficult with Japan before. I don't know if anybody remembers that uh, Australia's intelligence services were caught spying on Nippon Steel back in the day, uh, monitoring the quarterly uh, coking coal negotiations those relationships are always fraught and there's always some risk but so far there's been very little sign of a something that would really impact trade or prices uh, thank you i think in this case uh, economics trumps politics um so i think uh, we had a lot of um, a lot of questions today uh, some which were unanswered unfortunately but we've we've run out of time however i would like to stress that we uh, will be issuing an email uh, to answer those unanswered questions after the webinar. So the attendees uh, of, of this webinar will receive that. Um, and also to remind you all that in the next 24 hours, we will be sending out a link with the presentations uh, in this email, uh, in this webinar, sorry, and also um, a link to the video uh, recording of this webinar. So you can watch it again um, in your own time. Um, next week, we have a, um, another webinar, our July edition of Global Steel Markets on the 22nd of July, so in exactly a week's time. Uh, we are all very welcome uh, to, to partake in that. I would encourage you to, to join. Uh, myself and three of my colleagues will be giving an overview of the global market um, and answering any questions you may have. Um, but for now, I would like to thank my colleagues for their presentations, for uh, taking part in a very um, insightful and interesting discussion. I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining us in this webinar, um, and we hope to see you again soon. In the meantime, please stay safe, stay healthy, and take care of yourselves. All the best. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.